so much for coming. It's, it, that's, this is an aston absolutely astonishing crowd. I see one empty seat right here, uh, but otherwise there are none. Uh, so uh, first I want to uh, reiterate uh, that we are grateful to the Office of the Provost for being the major sponsor of uh, tonight's talk, which is in the Provost's lecture series. Um, and the talk is also co-sponsored by the Department of Ecology and Evolution and the Center for Communicating Science um, here on campus. And as Jeff mentioned, uh, this is a, a high point. Uh, tonight's talk will be the high point of this year's Darwin Day, which, as many of you know, is, uh, is an event that takes place on many college campuses, university campuses, and other institutions throughout the country uh, in early February, uh, marking the uh, anniversary of the birth of Charles Darwin, was uh, on February 12th, uh, exactly the same day of the same year as, Ab as Abraham Lincoln. Um, and, uh, and Darwin Day was initiated about 15 years ago as a vehicle for helping to uh, uh, basically provide information to the interested public about evolution um, as a, a, a reaction to the realization that among all the all the all the all the Western countries uh, in the world, uh, only one country ranks uh, beyond the United States in terms of the percentage of people who do not believe in evolution. Uh, you would have to go to Turkey to find a country in which a greater fraction of people do not accept the fundamental scientific framework of the biological sciences. Um, and uh, so it is in reaction to the, the rise of creationism and its various guises, such as so-called intelligent design, um, that Darwin Day is, has been established as a kind of educational forum uh, in which to explore uh, evolutionary issues. We are very fortunate tonight to have a truly distinguished and world-renowned paleontologist as our guest speaker, um, uh, Dr. Mark Norell, uh, who is the chair of the Division of Paleontology at the American Museum of Natural History, this department being one of the most prestigious uh, collections of paleontologists in the world, uh, and, and in the custody of one of the most valuable collections, paleontological collections in the world. Um, Dr. Norell received his degree in, at Yale in paleontology, um, and soon thereafter uh, uh, arrived at the American Museum 22 years ago, where he has been uh, ever since, um, and uh, uh, where he has been working chiefly, and been working on a vast variety of uh, issues in vertebrate paleontology, vertebrate evolution, um, but especially the evolution of the theropod dinosaurs, and their, uh, and from them, the evolution of the avian dinosaurs, which uh, I will be out watching tomorrow uh, in my my weekly uh, bird watching expedition. So three weeks I'm going to be out watching uh, dino, uh, looking for new species of, of, of dinosaurs. Um, uh, he, uh, uh, um, as you'll see, I suspect, uh, Dr. Norell is a master of all kinds of arcane, remarkable, uh, the application of some truly remarkable um, uh, uh, methods of studying fossils. But he also is active in field work. Uh, in Mongolia, China, and Romania, among other places, uh, where he spends quite a bit of time groveling around in the earth uh, digging up bones. I asked him what some of his uh, most uh, rewarding personal discoveries were in the course of his field work, and he said that finding nesting oviraptor dinosaurs was, uh, was chief among them, as well as finding dinosaur eggs, oviraptor eggs, that actually had dinosaur embryos. And can you imagine the thrill of finding an embryonic dinosaur that has been in the ground for more than 75 million years? In addition to his research, uh, Dr. Norell has uh, organized many uh, exhibitions at the American Museum of Natural History, uh, including um, uh, uh, one on entitled Mythic Creatures, uh, a recent exhibit uh, on the world's largest dinosaurs, and in addition, an exhibition called The Silk Road, um, 
the, uh, the history of, of, uh, of early uh, transit between Eastern Asia and Europe um, that, is, that reflects his interest and expertise in Asian art, among other things. Uh, so he's a highly versatile uh, person who is both scientist in both his scientific and non-scientific interests, who will be speaking tonight on how fossils reveal the evolution of birds from other <coughs> dinosaurs. Thanks a lot, Doug. I don't know how much of that is true or not. <laughs> Nevertheless, I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about uh, work that my research group has been involved in for the last couple of decades. And when I say my research group, it's this expansive group of people and institutions that loosely call themselves the Therapod Working Group, which is sort of centered in New York, but we sort of have base camps out here in Stony Brook, where one of my ex-students is a professor. Uh, in Beijing and Florida and Austin and a lot of other different places. So uh, it would be completely duplicitous of me to take credit for all of this stuff, but this is just basically the fruits of our efforts over the last couple of decades. Now what I'm going to try to convince you tonight is that uh, uh, dinosaurs aren't extinct, we just call them birds now, uh, that the typical traditional dinosaurs of the past looked, behaved, acted, and had biologies which are very different than the way in which they've been typically portrayed. So let's get going. To begin with, you know, birds have always had an iconic place within the minds of humans. That uh, maybe because they flew, maybe because they had attributes like feathers which aren't present in any other groups of, of, of animals, but they've had a place in art history going back as far as humans first started to depict things. They've also been something of a problem for biologists uh, in the sense that they're creepy, that in many ways that they carry on all these different kinds of forms in pop culture, but also just wondering about where they came from. That they're, it's almost like that they were specially created. I mean, that they have beaks, whereas things like lizards and crocodiles have teeth like we do. Uh, they have feathers, they fly, they have all of these other kinds of things. It was even a very big problem for, for Darwin when he wrote uh, The Origin of Species, as well as several of the contemporaries in 19th century Europe, uh, the French school, Darwin's colleagues in, in England, et cetera. So much so that you know, Darwin wrote in a letter to, the, uh, uh, to Asa Gray, a contemporary scientist, goes, the sight of a feather in a peacock's tail, whenever I gaze at it, makes me feel sick. <laughs> because he could come up with no evolutionary mechanism that would allow such something that he felt was so perfectly adapted for what it did, for the many things that feathers do to ever evolve. Because if we think of feathers, that feathers aren't just for flight, they're for display, like in this peacock, that they're for insulation, both in keeping warm as well as keeping cool. They repel water, they're used to make nests, uh, they're used as camouflage, they're used for lots of different sorts of things. They're very, they're very complex, they're very, uh, uh, just incredibly, complex, again, structures, and I'll get more to that a little bit about how we're starting to understand the evolution of them. But nevertheless, it's, you know, it's one of the several attributes that just really made birds special. <clears throat> now, when we look at a living bird, we can just see how special they are. In addition to, again, as I said before, <coughs> the feathers, they fly, they're highly intelligent, they're highly visual, they have beaks, they've been able, just with the living dinosaurs, the living birds, they've been able to occupy extremes in environment all the way from the hottest deserts in the world to the only terrestrial animals that, or semi-terrestrial animals that live in the, in the Antarctic. Uh, so they really, really do lots of amazing things. Well, the story of where birds actually came from and what their closest relatives are is basically coincident with the publication of Origin of the Species in 1859. This is the first feather of a bird that was ever found. This is the type specimen of Archaeopteryx, Archaeopteryx lithographica. And it's a single uh, covert feather from the wings. And it's asymmetric, so it's thought that this was a feather had some uh, aerodynamic appeal, or aerodynamic capabilities. It was named by Meyer in 1861 as Archaeopteryx, which just means you know, primitive bird. <clears throat> uh, two years later, a second specimen was found which became the London Archaeopteryx specimen. This was much more complete. It was represented by a pretty good skeleton in addition to 
that the beautiful wing feathers and the beautiful tail feathers it had. Immediately it was recognized that this was an intermediate, what was at that time called an intermediate link between what traditionally had been called reptiles and what traditionally were called birds. It had all these incredibly bird-like characteristics. It had feathers, it had a wishbone, but it retained several other characteristics as well. For instance, it had a very long tail, which living birds don't have. The hands, uh, or the, uh, the bones of the hand, rather than being fused into a single element, remained free, just the same way that they are in non-avian theropod birds. Well, this was immediately grasped upon by Thomas Huxley, who really got into the entire issue of birds, in, uh, of, <coughs> excuse me, of bird origins. Now, there's a, a couple of different stories about how Thomas Huxley came across this. I mean, he was, you know, the contemporary of Darwin's. He was the great expert on the Mesozoic animals, animals that lived during the traditional age of dinosaurs from the British islands. Uh, one story which that, you know, some people say it's completely apocryphal, some people say it's kind of true, other people say it's totally true, but no one's ever been able to find any evidence any one way or another, is that Huxley had been studying this animal as well as the London specimen of Archaeopteryx. This is a, a jaw of Megalosaurus, which is a large carnivorous dinosaur about half the size of Tyrannosaurus rex, uh, commonly found in the English countryside. It was one of the first dinosaurs ever to be recognized. Well, he'd been studying these specimens in his offices, and he went home to cut up a goose for Christmas dinner. And during, while he was cutting it up, he pulled the leg out, and he just had this sort of eureka moment. He said, yes, this is the same. Uh, it looks identical both to Megalosaurus as it does to Archaeopteryx. So from then he went and he published a couple of very important papers and after studying this animal as well, a small dinosaur from the same beds as Archaeopteryx called Compsognathus that was discovered in 1859, he wrote this and it's basically, we have had to stretch the definition of the class of birds so as to include birds with teeth and birds with paw-like forelimbs and long tails. There is no evidence that Compsognathus possessed feathers, but if it did, it would, it would be hard indeed to say whether it should be called a reptilian bird or an avian reptile. Well, shortly after he wrote this, he followed that up, this up with a paper that was published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, where he went and he outlined 16 characteristics that, of the skeletons of traditional dinosaurs and modern birds which that he felt supported the, the close relationship among the two groups. Uh, of those, more than half of those have stood up to scrutiny and are still evidence that we use to this day. Uh, the Archaeopteryx specimens just kept pouring in and the more that were found, the more that they told a similar but more complete story. This is the best preserved Archaeopteryx specimen. Uh, that is, is well known. This is the Berlin specimen of Archaeopteryx. And in addition to the beautiful skeleton, the beautiful uh, feathered wings, the feathered tail, it also preserves a skull. Now the skull looks dramatically unbird-like. If you took this same skull and, and you blew it up from the actual size that it is, which is about two inches across, to the size of an animal like Velociraptor, which has a skull which is about eight inches long, they would basically look identical. Uh, the teeth, the tooth form is identical. The configuration and the architecture of most of the bones of the skull are nearly identical. And quite different than the architecture of the skulls of modern birds in the sense that this animal in the skull of Archaeopteryx, as you can still see, it retains teeth. Uh, this is just a quick representation of the Archaeopteryx specimens that are known up to now. There's actually a new one which has just been has just been found, and I say found, I use that word rather loosely. It came out of an old collection that, of specimens that had been collected in the 19th century and just had never been recognized as Archaeopteryx before. So it's become a pretty well-known specimen. However, it doesn't really inform us that much about what actually the linkage between non-avian dinosaurs and modern birds beyond what Huxley outlined in the 1860s. And if you look at dinosaurs today, this is from a, a famous diorama at the British Museum, which I know you can't see it very well, but it's just hundreds and hundreds of hummingbirds put together, that the diversity of living birds is, is really quite high. There's at least 10,000 living species of birds alive today. Uh, some people, some of the people I work with in the ornithology department in New York say that the actual diversity, if you use the sorts of genetic markers that many people tend to define species on the basis of, 
probably is closer to 16 or 17,000 species alive today. Now, if you think of that within the context of traditional dinosaurs, the traditional non-bird dinosaurs lived between 65.3 million years ago and about 235 million years ago. So that's you know, a time period, give or take, 175 million years or so. Of those species, there's only about 1,200 named species which we know about. So there's 1,200 non-avian dinosaurs. There's up to 16,000 living dinosaurs. So I think that when people always ask me, what, why did dinosaurs go extinct? It's like they didn't. They're more common now than they ever have been. But nevertheless, is that if you uh, look at those, those 1,200 or so extinct dinosaurs that we have from the Mesozoic period, it just shows you how bad our fossil record is and how difficult it is to be able to study those things. Because of those 1,200, over half of those are known from unique specimens and often very fragmentary specimens. There's only a handful of those that we have more than 10 specimens of, probably only maybe 5% of all dinosaurs that we know about. So when we use dinosaurs to inform us about the past, we ha have to rely on a couple of things. One is sampling, which is key. And also, we have to be extraordinarily clever in trying to pick some of these things out. So let's just start going through some of the attributes that, that living birds share with their more primitive relatives. This is a skeleton of a modern bird. And there's a lot of things that you can see going on here. I mean, you can see that they have a big breastbone. They have three toes that all point forward. They have small heads and the like. Well, if we look at lots of the skeletal specializations, uh, we all know that birds have hollow bones. Uh, we all know birds have wish bones. We all know that birds have bony breast bones. And we know that birds have three primary toes on their feet that face forward. And you can just go to any sidewalk in New York City and see that the imprints that they left down from the concrete was wet and, and to determine that and say that that looks almost identical to the way that non-avian dinosaur footprints look like, <coughs> except for issues of scale. Uh, these characteristics, like most of the characteristics that I'll talk about tonight, are all things that early biologists felt were evolutionary adaptations for flight. I mean, birds had hollow bones to make the bones light so they could fly. Birds had wishbones because the wishbone acts as a spring to be able to help lift the wing back up after the downstroke. They had bony breastbones to support the all-important flight muscles. And then the three primary toes on the feet um, weren't really directly tied to flight, but nevertheless, sometimes they're implicated in perching and the like. Uh, this is what these things look like in modern birds. On the top left is a, a cross section through the upper leg bone of a, of, a, of a turkey, and you can see it's completely hollow. On the upper right, we have a wishbone. On the lower left, we have the bony breast bone. And on the lower right, we have uh, the three toes that all point forward. I mean, anybody who eats you know, barbecued chicken and things like that, you've seen this stuff a million times. Uh, what you haven't seen, and what you probably didn't know, is that it's really hard to argue that these things are adaptations for flight because that they go very, very deep into dinosaur history. This is the, this is the arm bone of a, of a Tyrannosaur from Mongolia. Uh, as you can see, it's completely hollow. Hollow bones are something that are primitive for the entire group of theropod dinosaurs. Uh, things like Velociraptor have bony breast bones right here and even wish bones. We, we now know that even that animals like Tyrannosaurus rex had wish bones. We also know that the wish bones have been forced further and further down the tree to the base of the great group of all carnivorous dinosaurs called theropod dinosaurs. So all theropod dinosaurs had wishbones. I and mean, wishbones are something which is, are very, very ancient in dinosaur history, long before flight was ever even a possibility. If we look at other characters of the morphology, uh, feathers, bright colors, single ovaries, and highly developed brains, these were also considered to be adaptations for, for flight. You know, feathers, obviously, because they carry a big aerodynamic function in the sense that unlike bats and flying reptiles like pterosaurs who have a, a skin-covered membrane which forms the flight surface. If you were to just to tear all the feathers off of a bird's wing, it would just be a single little strut. So the flight surface is made by a series of imbricating feathers that actually form the airfoil. Uh, bright colors have been looked at as a way in which the birds identify one another of their own species. A single ovary, I mean, most animals 
all animals basically that have sexual reproduction, there are vertebrates, have paired ovaries. Living birds have a single ovary. This was again something which people thought was a uh, adaptation for flight because eggs as the, the calcium is being deposited to form the eggshell can be very heavy. So if only one egg is being manufactured at a time, it's much easier to fly than if two are. Uh, and highly developed brains. And this, you know, birds have always been recognized as having very, very large brains, especially that the, uh, uh, the cerebrum is quite developed. Uh, some of this comes from, you know, older ideas, even some ideas that we had kicking around when we started looking into what the shapes of some of these dinosaur brains were, that the brains would fundamentally reorganize and get bigger when flight evolved as you went from living in a two-dimensional world to living in a three-dimensional world. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Well, let's start with feathers. Uh, feathers are remarkable structures that they have an incredible diversity throughout the avian world. Uh, up until the last 20 years that, you know, Darwin's quote I think was pretty much spot on as far as the way biologists considered feathers. We knew nothing about their origins. Archaeopteryx, even though it retains lots of these more primitive characteristics like teeth, a long tail, uh, et cetera, has feathers of completely modern aspect. If you were to like, you know, look at an Archaeopteryx feather, everyone would recognize it as a fully developed, full-blown feather. But we found a lot of great fossils through the years which have allowed us to come up with models of feather development. And this is just one of those models, and I'll get back to this in a couple of minutes, but that it's predicted from work which has been done in developmental genetics that the most primitive feather would be a feather which is just a single hollow filament. Because feathers, unlike hair, that the main part of the feather, the thing that forms the backbone of the feather called the rachis, is a hollow structure. The second most primitive feather would have been a series of these that all come out of the same follicle. Then it just goes you know, stepwise till we get basically feathers of modern organization. Then this evolves into something which is a branch structure, then something which is a branch structure but a more organized structure. Then this is just, you, know, you don't have to worry about this. This is just this one kind of very unusual form of feather. But then feathers which have a, a single large rachis down the middle, and then they have veins that come off the side, a very modern sort of feather, and then an asymmetrical feather that has a leading edge which is much shorter than the hind edge. And these are the sorts of feathers that are used uh, in, for aerodynamic capabilities. And then some of these really unusual feathers, these long feathers like this that are display feathers that one might see today in something like a, a tropic bird or a bird of paradise. Uh, this is again just a feather in detail. This is just basically to show that in addition to these primary branching that forms the veins of the feather, there's a secondary branching as well that goes between the individual elements of the veins of the feathers. that are called barbules that basically work like Velcro. So if you take a feather, and I'm sure we've all done it, and you mess it up, you can like run your hand along it and it goes back into trim. And the reason it goes back into trim is that there's these little self-organizing microscopic structures that interconnect with one another to be able to make the blade rigid. Well, you know, I personally, when I got into this business, never thought that we would find fossils that would uh, inform us at all about this particular problem. I mean, I thought we had Archaeopteryx and that was about as good as we were going to get. But the world really started to change about 15 years ago. And the world changed just because of the, the huge number of fossils that started to pour out of fossil deposits in northeastern China, in Liaoning province, and a little bit of Inner Mongolia. And these fossil specimens are remarkable in the sense that they possess not only hard parts, but they possess soft parts. Uh, it's thought that uh, lots of these animals were buried alive, basically. They're buried, they're gassed by volcanic events which that suffocated them. They were very, very quickly buried. And in addition to having exquisite skeletons, they also preserved soft tissue. Uh, this is a, a very, very primitive bird called, specimens of a very, very primitive bird called Confucius Ornus. And I think you can see cases where we have wings and things like that. We also have these big, long display feathers on the tail of one of these that's thought to be a male uh, that was you know, like a tropic bird or something like that. 
uh, there's literally thousands and thousands and thousands of these sorts of specimens that we've been able to collect. But the ones that really piqued our interest originally were animals like this. Now, this is the first of the feathered dinosaur. So this is Sinoceropteryx prima. It's a very small animal. It's about a foot and a half long. And all down the back of it, you see this crest that looks like a mohawk. And if you look at that, this sort of thing, if you look at it uh, under a microscope, you can see that these are individual filaments and individual actual feather-like structures that stick off off this animal's body. Now, I know it sort of looks like that this is just like a, a crest that runs along the top of the, the back and the bottom of the tail. But what you're looking at is you're looking at a three-dimensional animal that's been compressed into two dimensions and then split in half. And that, uh, I have some great pictures of, of things that look like this, but they're not often great for everyone's consumption. But if you're ever in the city and you see a pigeon that's been run over by 300 calves, you're going to see a bunch of blood and guts and bones in the middle and then some feathers on the periphery. And that's basically what we're looking at, except this is 125 million years old. So this was the first one of the so-called feathered dinosaurs. Now, this got tremendous play in northeastern China. They started making uh, uh, you know, their favorite liquor out of it called feathered dragon sorghum distilled rice beer or something <laughs> on it. Uh, it tastes really foul, but it, it was big news. Uh, the fossils, though, just kept on coming and coming. This was another specimen which we described in 2001. And what you're looking at is uh, a dromaeosaur, a very close relative of Velociraptor. And it's split into two slabs. It's car part and counterpart. So when these fossils are found, that it would, it's just like if you have a big, thick dictionary and you pretend that's a stack of rocks. And if you had an animal that was smashed on the inside of it, you would open up a page and half would be on one side and half would be on the other. So that they're split, opened up, and you get half on one side and half on the other side. What made this animal so spectacular was is that its entire body is covered with feathers. And not only is its entire body covered with feathers, its entire body is covered with all of the different feather types that we predicted, or we didn't predict, other groups predicted, would be present uh, in, from developmental biology. Everything from the stage one feathers, the single filaments, to the tufts, to self-organized feathers like these right here, where you can see the familiar herringbone structure uh, of uh, feathers behind the, behind the arm to similar specimens that are found with it, uh, feathers like these. And these are imprints. And right here, you can see the rachis, or the center part of the feather right here. And this is part of the shaft, and you can, or part of the, the, the blade or the vein. And you can see how that the individual elements of that blade are adhering to one another, indicating that these self-organizing structures, these barbules, were already present in animals that are pretty closely related to birds, but in no way are they, would anyone consider them to be birds. In fact, these animals are very closely related to animals like Velociraptor. Uh, the fossils really just kept on coming. Uh, this is what this animal would have looked like when it was alive, uh, again, with all three kinds of feathers. And they kept coming and coming and coming. This is a, a case of where we, not from northern China, but a specimen that we excavated in Mongolia that actually uh, Alan Turner, who's a professor here, worked on with me when he was a graduate student in New York. And up here at the top, we can see this is the ulna, or one of the forearm bones of Velociraptor. And this is the same corresponding bone of a vulture. And you can see that these are the individual feathers, and that they're coming off here. The individual feathers adhere to, as a pivot point, to the ulna on top of these little bumps of bone that one sees right here. Well, these sorts of things are also present in Velociraptor and giving us direct evidence that uh, uh, Velociraptor not only had feathers, it had feathers that we call pinaceous feathers, that are the kinds of feathers that modern birds had. Uh, further down the tree, this is the tail of a Tyrannosaur from China. Uh, and these filaments that you see coming off the top are indications that Tyrannosaurs themselves were also feathered. Now, I'm not going to say that a living, full-sized adult Tyrannosaurus rex looked like a giant chicken. But <laughs> if you have to think of when these things hatched. They would have been about half a meter long at the largest. If one of the reasons for feathers would be to keep warm as an insulation blanket, uh, these animals would have been feathered when they came out of the egg. Uh, 
if they, when they come into thermal equilibrium with the environment, which is at about 600 pounds when their problem isn't maintaining heat anymore, in some cases it's dumping it, uh, they, they may have lost them or they may have kept some of them for display structures. In fact, I know they kept some of them for display structures, but uh, I can't really talk about it tonight because it's work which will be published uh, by another group in the next several weeks. But that they, they uh, clearly were feathered. And I think we have every indication now that feathers and feather-like structures are not just present in tyrannosaurs, but probably were a characteristic of almost all dinosaurs. Because theropod dinosaurs belong to one of the great groups of dinosaurs, the group called Ceristians. The other great group that includes things like triceratops and duck-billed dinosaurs and that sort of thing, uh, there's been feather traces found in primitive members of that group as well. In, in, that have just been reported on in the last year and a half, again, from the, these localities in northeastern China. So then if we look at the evolution of feathers, and we have sort of a simplified family tree of dinosaurs here, we have you know, these stage one feathers, which are the hollow tubes, and then we have all the filaments coming out right here. Then we get further down, and we get the, the self-organizing structures, the barbules, and then we get the blades. We can see that none of these can be, are indicative of flight, since stage one feathers are very primitive for theropods, probably present in all dinosaurs. Stage two feathers are nested way deep in the, the theropod family tree. Feathers of modern aspect, just like the feathers we see in a modern bird, were present in animals like Velociraptor, <coughs> and Troodon, and Deinonychus, and all of these. And it isn't until we get up very near to the, the base of modern birds do we start getting these asymmetric feathers that one finds in Archaeopteryx and uh, some other animals, which I'll get back to in a few moments. Uh, <clears throat> I was going to mention a little bit about color. Uh, birds are very, very visual. Uh, you know, mammals, they smell very well, uh, but they don't see very well. Mammals, you know, people who are hunters have to like stalk wildebeest from two miles upwind because that they can detect sense so well. You know, dogs, we all know, smell, or are, are able to. I mean, dogs smell, but in addition to that, <laughs> they're able to smell, uh, have a very uh, great sense of olfaction. Uh, birds don't smell very well, with a couple of exceptions. But they see incredibly well. In fact, they see so much better than us that we can't even comprehend it. Uh, they see into the ultraviolet spectrum and into the infrared spectrums. They see more colors than we do. They also see far better than we do in the sense that uh, uh, it's like using an old computer monitor to a new computer monitor because of the light sensing organs in their eyes are more tightly packed. So that's what allows eagles to be able to find you know, mice from 1,500 feet in the air and the like. Uh, but their color patterns on their feathers, you know, they, they do a lot of things. They do camouflage. They do things like. Uh, thermal equilibrium, they, they dump heat or keep heat, they're used for display, they're used for attraction, they're used for bluffing, et cetera. Now, there's three ways in which color exists in feathers. One way is structural color, and that is when you get iridescence, like on hummingbirds, that kind of thing, when you have light diffraction happening. Uh, a second way is that through melanin in two kinds of melanosomes, things called phaomelanosomes and things called eumelanosomes, which impart real, actual color to the feather itself. And then the third way of the really spectacular colors is through carotenoids, which are a class of organic molecules that, uh, uh, that concentrate in feathers themselves to, to make these colors. Well. One of the questions that we've been interested in looking at is, can we figure out what color some of these feathered dinosaurs were? And uh, that, uh, you know, again, through the extended research networks that uh, we work on, we work in, we've been, we've been doing this. We've been doing it in two ways. For the melanosome work, if you look at melanosomes themselves, and this is a collection of birds that runs all the way from, uh, you know, ducks to parrots to penguins. And you look at the individual feathers, and you look at them under scanning electron microscopy. The melanosomes, which make the individual colors, are different shapes. And you can take and you can measure these and come up with a uh, statistical analysis to be able to predict what color the animal was based on the shapes of the melanosomes. Well, the specimens from northeastern China are so remarkably preserved that we can find 
fossil melanosomes in those as well. And this is a, a picture from a, a, a paper which we have in press right now that about one of these Chinese feathered animals right here. And it's based on the shape of the melanosomes. We know exactly what color this animal was when it was alive. Uh, I can't tell you what that is because the paper's not out yet. That's why it's just shown as black here. But nevertheless, it'll be out in a few weeks, so you'll be able to read about it then. Well, that's for one class of, the, of these, uh, uh, these colors. The second class are the really bright, flashy colors, like in Orioles and uh, Warblers and Finches and the like, is really what we'd like to go after. To do that's going to take something else because that color isn't imparted by melanosomes. Again, it's imparted by these carotenoid-based things. So uh, we've been using the uh, synchrotron in uh, Palo Alto, which is you know, basically a, a machine. It's a big ring, donut-like thing, about two kilometers across, with magnets in it that, it, that accelerate electrons up to within a tiny percentage of the speed of light. Uh, by attenuating the electrons to different speeds, we're able to get excitation of different compounds that are present in fossils in very low amounts. So we've been doing tests like this where we put fossils into the chamber. And here is the, uh, the synchrotron electron beam coming out. This is a TV camera we used to focus with. And this is a detector. So basically what happens is the electrons get shot into this helium atmosphere. Then they bounce out. They go into the detector. And we get a signature of what elements are there. Uh, this is one of the specimens that we've been working on. This is a dinosaur, but it's not from the age of dinosaurs. This is about uh, 35, 40 million years old from the Green River Formation in Wyoming. And it's a bird, a half of a bird skeleton. If you just looked at this, you wouldn't see any indication of feathers or anything else. But if we apply synchrotron radiation to it, it attenuated at, at, different, uh, at, at different speeds, we can excite different sorts of, of chemical compounds. This is for copper. So all you can see these feathers coming out here, here, and here. None of these, again, are visible to the naked eye. This is all things that have concentrated copper. Uh, and copper is one of the classes of elements which are found in some of these carotenoids that color feathers. So after like running all these different feathers to come up with standards, I think we're getting pretty close to looking at this. Uh, this is a composite of copper, of nickel, and of manganese. Again, three things that are very important components of some of these uh, uh, carotenoids that cause color. And you can see it all over the place. And in addition to the feathers around the leg here, you can see that these big tail feathers coming back that are often quite colorful in living birds, that uh, this actually looks like it's going to work. And I think perhaps a year from now, we may even have some really good results to go from just you know, how colorful some of these things were uh, that are truly not birds. Well, moving to some of the other attributes of birds, I mentioned the presence of one ovary. This is a modern bird nest, but this is of, of five eggs, but then the other egg in the nest is a, is a nest parasite where another bird has laid an egg in the nest. But you know, living birds lay one egg at a time. In the fossil record from skeletons uh, the, or nests that we found, you can actually see that all the eggs in most fossil non-avian dinosaurs are paired, so that, which indicates they laid two eggs at a time, one from each ovary. There's even been a specimen which has been excavated, not by our group, but has uh, two eggs that are still stuck in the oviducts on the inside of the specimen, again, giving clear evidence that these animals had two functioning ovaries. Uh, this is a nest of a Troodonta dinosaur that uh, we excavated. And what you're looking at is from above. You're looking at about 15 eggs that had already hatched. On top of the nest, we found a series of babies that were living in the nest after, after it had hatched. <laughs> And in addition to the babies, we found shed teeth of the adults, like this one right here, inside the eggs, indicating the parents were coming back to the nest after the young had hatched. So showing, definitely showing some sort of advanced parental care. But what is really interesting about this is if you do a mathematical deconstruction of this nest and come up with the probability that these eggs were laid in a paired fashion, like they are in more primitive dinosaurian groups, uh, it comes up negative every time, no matter how you do it. We feel this is strong evidence that one oviduct, again, evolved long before flight ever evolved, that it was an adaptation for something completely different, and again, smearing this 
idea of birds further down, uh, these characters of birds further down the tree. As far as large brains go, and the, the, uh, uh, the uh, reorientation of the architecture of the brain of going from a two-dimensional world to a three-dimensional world, this is work of uh, Amy Balanoff, one of my graduate students. And this is the brain in different colors here, broken up into its different constituents of a living bird, of a grebe. You can see this big area right here, that's the cerebrum, one of the major information processing centers of the brain. But then we can look at some more primitive things. This is an alligator down here. You can see how the brain is linear. It's just in a straight line. You can also see that the relative parts of the brain aren't are all, you know, the forebrain, midbrain, and hindbrain are all about the same size. This is a CAT scan of uh, reconstruction of the Archaeopteryx brain. This is, would be a three-dimensional world brain, you know, an animal that probably had some volant activity. It's S-shaped, but also the cerebrum is very large. This is the uh, brain uh, of an animal called Sagan, which is a close relative of a Velociraptor. It's identical to the primitive bird brain in the sense that it has this S shape. It has a very, very large cerebrum. Clearly, this animal wasn't a flyer. Once again, the, the development of the brain and the development of these big processing centers had nothing to do with the origin of flight. It was all something which evolved long beforehand. Even if you look at brain size, you can see that uh, uh, traditional dinosaurs, the dinosaurs that are most closely related to modern birds, if you look at the endocranial volume, which is basically just how much the, the head holds within the brain case, and compare that with the, uh, the cerebrum, where this big sort of new processing center is, and you graph those, and you can see that the dinosaurs fall out on the same line as living birds do. The blue dots are living birds, and the uh, red dots and the white dots are uh, non-avian dinosaurs. So that this enlargement in brain size Nothing to do with birds, something much more primitive within dinosaur history. Well, if we quickly move to behavior, there's lots of things we can say. Stereotypical resting behavior, birds flock. They brood their nests. They fly. All of these things, once again, were considered to be big uh, characteristics of birds that aided things about their ability to fly. Uh, any of you who have birds at home in cages or observe birds know that birds typically tuck their heads in to their, next to their wing. Uh, this is considered to be a way in which that they retain heat. Uh, birds have highly active metabolisms and they have to eat a huge amount. Uh, especially in small birds, they can lose heat very, very quickly. So they try to bundle themselves into a ball to present the least surface area they possibly can while they're resting. Uh, this is a specimen which my colleague in Beijing, Xu Xing, and I worked on several years ago. And it's a little hard to read, but this is a non-avian dinosaur in that exact same resting behavior. Here's the head right here. Here's the elbow right here. And here's the tail wrapped up around it. This animal uh, was, is just one of the most remarkable specimens that I've ever had the opportunity to work on. We have a lot of evidence that this came this animal was buried alive after it was gassed. Uh, it comes from a layer near the town of Lujiatun, in what we call the Lujiatun Pompeii beds. And we have quite a bit of separate evidence that up to about eight feet of volcanic ash rained down on this area in about two minutes. So it's very, very similar to the postures you see that are very lifelike postures of human bodies at Herculaneum and Pompeii when the exact same thing happened, except this happened 130 million years ago in northern China. But it is a snapshot of a behavior, of, a, of an event that, the, that, uh, you know, that this animal still preserves for us. Because it's not very often that we get to see you know, actual behaviors in the fossil record. Uh, this is what it would have looked like right before it got gassed and then completely covered with sediments. Uh, birds flock, we all know that. Giant starling flocks occur out here on Long Island every year. Uh, ground birds flock as well. We excavated a bone bed at a place called Hulsan several years ago. And this is in uh, south central Mongolia. It's a you know, very, very beautiful place. It has these big cliffs like this. Well, in this bone bed, we collected the remains of around 70 different dinosaurs in various states of articulation. Uh, and if we draw them all out like this, what we found is we found that there was 
three adults, and we were able to tell how old they were. I'll tell you how we figured that out in a minute. But uh, one of them was 13 years old. Uh, two of them were nine years old. They had just stopped growing. They were mixed in with the rest of the flock, was all juveniles, but all in the same age cohort, all about a year and a half old. And these animals were killed by a catastrophic sand dune collapse all at one time. It was a flock that was just taken out. So this was a social group you know, of animals exhibiting many of the same behaviors that living birds do in flocks. As far as brooding goes, you know, birds sitting on their nests is something which is known in antiquity and is one of the more you know, familiar sites that everybody thinks is special about birds. Uh, this is a specimen that we excavated several years ago. This is uh, the one which Doug was referring to as one of the things that I think is one of the best things that I've ever found. And what you're looking at is you're looking down on the top of a nest. Here's the right arm. Here's the left arm. This is about uh, four feet across right here. So this is the left arm. Here is the left leg. Here's the right egg. The legs are kind of hunched up underneath of it. Here's the breastbone. Here's the wishbone. The rest of the skeleton had eroded away. But underneath of it is about 30 eggs that are laid in pairs. So this animal is sitting on top of its nest when it, it died and it was covered. Uh, it's not a unique find. I mean, we, found, we personally have found four other specimens. And there was just a paper published in PLOS One last week by uh, Phil Curry's group out of the University of, or out of Calgary, who excavated another nest with an adult on it in Mongolia as well. This is what the animal would have looked, looked sorry, this is what the animal would have looked like when it was alive on top of its nest. Uh, so it, the whole idea of you know, birds brooding their eggs, well, birds are a kind of dinosaur, but brooding goes way back in dinosaur history. Uh, some of the fossils that we found in, uh, or we didn't find these, we had the pleasure of working on them. None of the fossils in northern China are collected by real paleontologists. Most of them are found by farmers who then sell them to real paleontologists. Uh, and that, uh, but some of these do have some impart on the role of flight. This is a very famous specimen of an animal called Microraptor guai. And here's the head, here's the forewing, and you can see these big feathers coming off that form a front airfoil. The really interesting thing about this is it appears to have four wings in the sense that it has big airfoils off its hind limb as well. Uh, we've been in the process of trying to figure out what these are for. So to do that, what we do is we build models. And this is a model of a uh, microraptor. And we can pose these models in different poses. Like we can spread the legs out. We can do other kinds of things. Then we can put them in a, in, inside of a wind tunnel. Uh, this is at MIT where we've been doing these experiments. And then we can fly them in this wind tunnel and look for the optimality criteria. of If these animals actually did fly or glide through the air, which wing posture would be the best within the realm of possibility? And what we found is that this X-wing configuration like this, which makes a lot of sense because that, uh, when we talk to the aerodynamic engineers on our team, it's this is exactly what the Wright brothers did, except the Wright brothers did it the other direction. So it's an X-wing configuration where that you have a, a primary airfoil that's large and an, another smaller airfoil that's a stabilizer that's also horizontal, but lies either above or below the primary airfoil. And uh, <coughs> since we've done the initial experiments, we've gone on to do some more and some more and some more, and we all tend to they all tend to really converge on this X-wing idea for the, the posture of these animals. Uh, the Microraptor guii specimen, I should also say, isn't just an aberrant one-off now that there's maybe 25 of these specimens known that all show this great configuration of, I mean, this really unusual configuration of these flight-like feathers on the hind limbs themselves. Well, then if we move away from behavior and skeletons toward physiological attributes, uh, some things that we can say about living birds is that they grow fast, right? Uh, also is that somatic and sexual maturity are coupled, meaning that a four foot long alligator that will eventually grow to 13 feet can breed. But birds don't breed until they're fully grown. So we wanted to see that if we could figure some of this stuff out. Uh, OK, as far as birds growing fast, I think everybody realizes that. The chickens we eat are about six weeks old. Uh, 
you can see gigantic flocks of pigeons and you don't see any baby pigeons at all because they grow explosively. If you want to look at these sorts of things in fossils though, you have to find a way to be able to age dinosaurs. And the, to do that, uh, there's a very clever technique uh, that uh, my colleague Greg Erickson came, or actually he didn't come up with it, but he was the one who did most of the empirical research on it. It's long been recognized that when you cut the bones of certain dinosaurs, crocodiles, alligators, and things like that, that you, you see rings. And these rings look like tree rings. And some people said, oh, these are seasonal rings. Some people said these are yearly rings. But what Greg did is he took and he labeled alligators with orochrome and tetracycline and he did it over a series of years. He would inject alligators with this stuff. Then after seven years, he killed the alligators, cut the bones, and he found that there was this annual ring, and then there was a label, annual ring, label ring. So he firmly established then that these animals were, in fact, there these rings were, in fact, annual rings. So after he did that, then we sort of went around begging uh, curators around the world to uh, allow them to cut up their dinosaur bones. And that, uh, you know, fortunately, at least I, coming from the American Museum, I have kind of some, I get cut some slack. Because if they ever want to do anything in our collection, they have to let us do what we want to do. But <laughs> that I think I would have had a lot of trouble if I was other places. Uh, but what we found, we found some very interesting things. Uh, this is uh, a slice through the fibula, the small bone on the lower leg, the one when you eat a chicken leg that comes to a, a big point. This is of the Sioux Tyrannosaur specimen in Chicago. And these lines reflect growth. So this is its 12th year, its 13th year, 14th year, 15th year, 16th year, 17th year, 18th year, 19th year. At 19 years, it quit growing. It didn't get any bigger. They have determinate growth. After that, it goes into something which is called, they still lay the rings down, but the rings are much more closely packed. Uh, the Sioux specimen was, uh, so it grew to adult size in 19 years. It lived to be 26 years old. It was the oldest tyrannosaur that we, that we found. Uh, but what we did find out is that all tyrannosaurs, Tyrannosaurus rex, Albertosaurus, Alliramus, all these different kinds of tyrannosaurs, it seems to be a characteristic of tyrannosaurs that they grew to adult size in 19 years, or b between 18 and 19 years. Uh, you know, pretty much in the same time period it takes a human to grow to adult size. So the question that we started to ask ourselves is, well, what can we, I mean, if, if you are a uh, Tyrannosaur, if your Tyrannosaur is Rex, you're about a third to, to uh, a half as big as your closest relative. How do you get that way? Well, there's two ways that you can do that. You can either grow faster than your ancestor, or you can grow longer than your ancestor. Well, we showed that they all grew to adult size in 19 years, so that just meant the Tyrannosaurus Rex grew faster. And the rates of growth in Tyrannosaurus rex are truly astounding. This is just another picture showing these rings. This is of a Tyrannosaur which died in its fifth year of growth. Well, what we showed is this curve right here. And uh, Tyrannosaurus grew really, really quick. Uh, Tyrannosaurus rex, between the time that it was about 12 years old and, between, and 18 years old, just about the time that it quit growing, it was growing about 1,600 pounds a year. So you're talking about you know, four pounds a day, at least. And that's a, that's, that's a startling growth rate. Now, what, the only animals, except for living birds, which have these kind of growth rates today, there's no mammals that do. The fastest growing mammals are marine mammals. And they grow really quickly because they eat gallons and gallons and gallons of mother's milk, which is one of the most high fat, high caloric substances on the planet. Uh, Tyrannosaurs, when they were growing this fast, they had to kill what they ate. So they had to be energetically uh, you know, very, very active animals to be able to just consume that amount of meat to s sustain those growth rates for that amount of time. Uh, while Tyrannosaurus grew fast, though, they still didn't grow as fast as Archaeopteryx did. And we were able to convince our colleagues in Munich to allow us to take, to destructively sample one of the iconic Archaeopteryx specimens. Uh, to just take really small pieces of bone, like on the order of, of uh, 
15 micron pieces off of the specimen and then to be able to do the same sort of analysis that we did with Tyrannosaurs. Uh, this is what we found, this is what the bones look like. And again, it just attests to how remarkably some fossils can be preserved that to where we have the A, which is a, uh, or the A specimen on the left is a living animal, the B specimen on the right is a fossil. And those little holes are actual markers of where the osteocytes, that the bone forming cells lived. Well, what we found then is that we found we were able to create a growth curve then for Archaeopteryx. We found that Archaeopteryx grew faster than Tyrannosaurus, but it still didn't grow as fast as a living bird did. Uh, uh, Archaeopteryx would reach adult size after about two years. And Archaeopteryx didn't weigh that much. Archaeopteryx weighed about a kilogram, so a little over two pounds. So Archaeopteryx grew to adult size in the same time that it takes a living ostrich to grow to adult size, which weighs a lot more than that. So that while these non-avian dinosaur rates are fast, they're not as fast as modern birds, but they're still a lot faster than things like crocodiles and things like lizards and that sort of thing. As far as the somatic and sexual maturity goes, that uh, as I said before, you know, in crocodiles, somatic maturity occurs after sexual maturity, so they're completely decoupled. In birds, somatic maturity and sexual maturity is coincident. It happens at the same time. Well, to do this, we went around and we were able to age using the technique I did talked about before, lots of different dinosaurs. And we aged animals that also were associated with nests. So we had an idea that these animals were sexually mature because we found them either on eggs or associated with their own kinds of eggshells, so their parents, basically. And then the question we asked is like here in a lizard, the uh, sexual maturity occurs in this part of the growth curve, and then in crocodiles in this part of the growth curve. In living birds, when the growth curve is flattened out and uh, the animal is completely grown. So we were looking at what was going on in the non-avian dinosaurs. And what we found is that, again, something which is a little intermediate, that they, within confidence intervals, uh, non the non-avian dinosaurs we studied were 90% of full grown when they were able to breed. Not as much as a living bird, but far greater than exists in crocodiles and in lizards and the like. So again, this is an evolving, it's part of a continuum, it's an evolving physiology as you move toward the crown group of living birds. So what I'd like to leave you with is that our idea of birds being this, these fantastic, wonderful creatures that are so incredibly finely tuned for flight, every aspect of their body, every aspect of their behavior, every aspect of their physiology relates to being a modern bird is really a lot more blurry than that. And as far as the non-avian dinosaurs go, we can leave that notion behind, these pictures of, like, from our youths of uh, these animals being you know, big, dumb, scaly, boringly colored, et cetera. And if we were able to take ourselves back 135 million years ago to modern China, the world would look a lot more like this or like this. And most of you who are out there who aren't zoologists would just say, these are some really stupid, weird looking birds walking around. <laughs> and they would behave like, they would look like, they would think like living birds do. They would just look strange. So thank you.